Alright, this is a video on using the Laplace transform to solve ordinary differential equations, specifically second order linear differential equations with constant coefficients and various right hand side forcing functions. I'm going to run through an example that's already worked out to show you an overview of the method, then we'll go through one in detail step by step and even show how we can use CoCalc to do some of the heavy lifting. Here's our initial value problem y double prime minus 4y equals 2 times e to the 3t. And the first thing we do is take the Laplace transform of both sides of the differential equation. We denote this with capital L. The Laplace transform operator is linear, so it can be distributed to individual terms. So we distribute that. You can even bring the 4 outside of the operator, again by linearity. Uh, then you'll have the Laplace transform of the first and second derivatives, and we have formulas for that that are derived in the book. They uh, involve the Laplace transform of the function y, which we denote capital Y of s. Uh, so t is our independent variable in the normal space, s is our independent variable in the Laplace transform space. Um, and they also relate it to the initial conditions. So there's formulas there. Uh, you may not need to both of them, right? In this example, you don't have the first derivative, so you don't need that formula, but you have the second derivative, so you use that one. Um, after you use those formulas, the left-hand side just has the Laplace transform of y, no derivatives. So you're able to algebraically solve for that and then take the inverse transform. Now, the Laplace transform of the right-hand side function is found using technology or using a table. In this class, uh, we have a table provided in the book. There's a separate PDF underneath the reading for Experience 9. And you would find the function in the left column that you want to take the transform of, in this case, e to the at, and then the corresponding transform is in the right column. So, like I said, we're going to solve for big Y of s. Often when you do this, you're going to get something that's a complicated rational function of s. In order to take the inverse transform without technology, uh, you know, this table is pretty limited, so you're looking at just what's here. There are some rational functions, but uh, something that this complicated, you're going to need to break it up. So often we do a partial fraction decomposition. And the book has some great techniques about this, so I recommend ready, reading through the book and seeing what they say. Um, but we basically look at the factor denominator and we want to try to separate this big rational into a bunch of smaller fractions where each one just has one of those factors. Right, so s minus 3, s minus 2, s plus 2. And then we try to figure out what those numerators are going to be. Uh, the way to solve this equation for a, b, and c is to multiply by the denominators. And then often you can put in certain values for s to simplify this and figure out what a, b, and c are. Uh, the technique here is that if you put in s equal to 3, you're going to make this factor 0 and this factor 0, so b and c are gone, and you're able to figure out what a is. Similarly, you can figure out what b and c are by letting s be 2 and negative 2, respectively. Once you have a, b, and c, you can then write out the inverse, write out the Laplace transform in terms of those three simpler fractions. And, uh, you know, these coefficients a, b, and c aren't a big deal because they can go right outside the inverse transform, which is also linear. You take the inverse transform of this and uh, use the table in reverse. So these are all 1 over s minus a number, and that follows this pattern here. So depending on what a is, you get different exponentials, and we end up with this sum of three exponentials. Uh, and this differential equation could have been done with... Um, method of undetermined coefficients because it was a simple enough right inside forcing function um, but you can we're going to see later especially when we get into uh, unit uh, unit step functions and piecewise continuous that the Laplace transform method has a great advantage so let's now get to solving our example 2 in detail and we know this process works now we start by taking the Laplace transform of the ODE so we're going to use big L to take the transform, and we're going to do that on both sides. And 
the linearity of the Laplace transform operator allows us to not only distribute it to these individual terms, but to then bring out constant coefficients. So for instance, that 5 can be brought out, this 6 can be brought out, and this 10 can be brought out. And we get to using the formulas. These are going to be related to our <laughs> initial condition. So recall that the function is 2 and the derivative is 1. So uh, this formula that relates the Laplace transform of the first derivative has minus y at 0, which is going to be minus 2. So we would take the differential equation and we would replace the Laplace transform of y prime with this. And you notice that there, that 5 now is going to have to distribute, so you don't want to use parentheses around that substitution. So that negative 5 distributes to the negative 2 as well. Right. And we got a formula for the Laplace transform of the second derivative, and this has both initial conditions in it. So remember, y prime of 0 is 1, so we can have minus 1. And then y of 0 is 2, so this is going to be a 2s. So we will substitute this for the Laplace transform of the second derivative. Okay. For the right-hand side, you can use technology, but these will often show up in the table. In this case, we're looking for e to the t times cosine of t. And that shows up here, where you can have parameters lambda and omega. In this case, they're just both 1. So if lambda is 1 and omega is 1, we're going to have s minus 1 over s minus 1 squared plus 1 squared. And of course, we have a 10 there. So that 10 will be in the numerator. So let's write out the differential equation with the transformed forcing function. And we get that. And we know solving for big Y of S, right, forgot, the Laplace transform of Y is big Y of S. So big L of Y is the same as big Y of S. Um, solving for big Y of S is a matter of using algebra on the left hand side to first remove terms that don't have big Y of S, and then factor off the big Y of S and the terms that do. I think the first thing we're going to want to do is distribute this negative 5. And so it'll be negative 5 times S, big Y of S. And then negative 5 times negative 2 is plus 10. So distributing the negative 5, we get that. And then we're going to combine like terms. We've got a positive 10 and a negative 1, which will give us a positive 9. At this point, we can get rid of the terms that don't have a big Y of S. So we're going to add 2S to both sides. And we're going to subtract 9 from both sides.
I'm going to factor big Y of S on the left. So we'll get s squared minus 5s plus 6. To finish solving for big Y of s, we will divide by that. So that will go in the denominator of the first term. And it will make the second term a rational function with that denominator. So here we get to the part where we need to try to take the inverse transform, and this doesn't look like anything in the table. So we're going to use partial fraction decomposition to try to break it up into smaller pieces that do. What I'd like to do is take this fraction and rewrite it where one term has just the s squared minus 5s plus 6. And one term has just the s minus 1 squared plus 1. Since these are quadratic denominators, you need to use numerators that are linear. So we'll have a s plus b, c s plus d. And we're going to multiply through by the denominators. and we'll get that. And at this point, typically, we'll put in certain values of s, and we'll be able to directly identify the unknown coefficients in the numerator. But there's some problems here. Mainly, this s minus 1 squared plus 1 is never 0 for any value of s. So we're not able to zero out c and d. The s squared minus 5s plus 6 is 0 when s is 2 or 3. So that factors into s minus 2, s minus 3. So we are going to take advantage of that and use that to find out what c and d are. So let's first let s equal 2. And when s is 2, we have 10 on the left. The entire as plus b part is 0. This is 2c plus d. And then we get a 2 here. So this simplifies to 5 equals 2c plus d. Now I'm going to let s equal 3. And when s is 3, I get a 2 here. Again, this whole first term is 0. I get a 3c plus d. And then this last part turns to a 5. Dividing both sides by 5. We're going to have 4 equals 3c plus d. Now we have a little system of equations here for c and d, and it's pretty easy to solve. You can actually just subtract the bottom from the top, and what you're going to end up with is 1 equals negative c, which tells you c is negative 1.
Once you know C, it's easy to get D. Go into either equation, and for instance, this one, uh, if C is negative 1, then D is 7. So we now know what C and D are, and we need to figure out what A and B are. I mentioned before, there's no way to zero out C and D using an S value. So we are going to have to use these numbers here we came up with, and then pick what is going to be most convenient to find A or B. To find B, notice that when S is 0, A will go away. So let's take advantage of that. Now D doesn't go away when S is 0, but we know what D is. It's 7. And we have negative 1 squared, which is 1, and 1 plus 1 is 2. So we're able to figure out what B is, because we have negative 20 minus 14 is negative, sorry, negative 10 on the left. Negative 10 minus 14 is negative 24, divide by 6, and you see that B equals negative 4. Now, since we have A, B, C, so we have we have B, C, and D, we can pick anything we want for S to figure out A, but certain values will still be easier than others. I'm going to use S equals 1. <laughs> Obviously, we can't use S equals 0, uh, but any other value of S would tell us what A is. When S is 1, the left side is 0. And I'm going to go ahead and put in the value for B. And we have 1 squared minus 5, which is negative 4, plus 6 is 2. And C is negative 1, plus D is 7, so that's 6. And then that goes away, and that's just 1, so we have just 6 there. So uh, subtracting 6, dividing by 2 is negative 3. Uh, negative 3 plus 4 is 1. So A equals 1. So we can now write out what the Laplace transform of S is in terms of three rational expressions. We're going to split it up, the first one, into two. And we're going to put in those values for A, B, C, and D. So A is 1. B is negative 4, C is negative 1, and D is 7. The next thing to notice is that the last two rational expressions have the same denominator. So we are able to freely add those by just adding the numerators. So 2s minus s is s, and negative 9 plus 7 is negative 2. This can be further simplified when you factor that denominator. And we used that earlier, the fact that this is s minus 2 times s minus 3. We can simplify that as just 1 over s minus 3. And 1 over s minus 3 is pretty easy to take the inverse transform of. So then the question becomes, how can we take the inverse transform of that first fraction? So there's your 1 over s minus 3. It's going to be a e to the 3t. Um, that other one has that s minus 1 squared plus 1 that looks a lot like these. If we were to let lambda be 1 and omega be 1, we have the denominator right. But we would need the top to either be a constant or s minus 1. And we have neither. But through a clever subtraction here, we can think of that minus 4 as minus 1 minus 3. Of course, negative 1 and negative 3 is negative 4.
and we can then split this up as two fractions. One with a negative three, and one with just s minus one. So the first fraction now fits the pattern for the e to the t cosine t. And the second one, I know that three looks out of place, but remember a constant's not a big deal. You can just bring that out front. If we bring the negative three out front, it's a one up top, and that would be like this, which is e to the t sine t. So we're now ready to take the inverse Laplace transform of each term. And we use L to the negative one power, kind of like inverse function notation, to denote the inverse Laplace transform. So there's the inverse transform of the left side. And then we're going to have the inverse transform of the right side. Now the inverse transform of the transform brings you back to the function itself, y of t. The linearity of the inverse transform allows us to distribute this to each one of these fractions. The linearity also allows us to bring that negative 3 out of that middle fraction. Then it's just a matter of looking things up in the table. Right. The inverse transform of the first fraction is e to the t cosine t. The second fraction was e to the t sine of t. And the last one is e to the 3t. Now, there's a lot involved here, and you may want to use technology in the places that we mentioned it was usable. Using CoCalc, we have the document called Laplace Transforms of CoCalc in the Experience 9 page, and it'll do all or some of the work. Um, if we go ahead and cut out this part, you can see that you need to set up your variables. Remember, s is your independent variable for the normal space, and t is for the transform space. And uh, we can use y here. Y here. Uh, y dot Laplace t comma s will do a Laplace transform. So this, for instance, would be having it do the transform of the right-hand side that we did earlier on. It won't really do the transforms of the derivatives that easily. It's probably easier for you to use those formulas. But notice that's what we got earlier when we did the transform right here in step 5. The next thing that you might want to have it do is to do the partial fraction decomposition. So at one point we had solved for big Y of S and it was pretty crazy at the end of step six and you wanted to do that partial fraction decomposition from step seven, that was a lot of work. You can have CoCalc do that. Just do whatever your name of function is dot partial underscore fraction of the variable s in this case. And it instantly does what we did. So that s squared minus 2s plus 2, that's the same as s minus 1 squared plus 1. It's just written out. So you would have to go back to uh, making sure that you understood that was the same as that for doing the inverse transform. Uh, but this is where it gets even better, is that you can actually have CoCalc do that inverse transform. Um, so feeding it the same thing without even breaking it up into those partial fractions, uh, you can have CoCalc 
do the inverse Laplace transform. And of course, it, it gives you a factor e of t, but that's the same solution that we found earlier. Now, you can also have it do a de solve underscore Laplace, where it'll you just give it the original differential equation and initial conditions, and it does all the work. But this does not always work. Um, there has to be certain restrictions on the variables t and the functions, and I've had mm -hmm. problems with this always working. So um, it will work for the assignment in the lab, um, but it's uh, not a method that will always work. OK, so now we know how to take the Laplace transform a differential equation and use that to find the solution.